Hello, good evening, everybody. Tom, I'm very pleased to invite you to give the final meeting of this epiphany series of talks we've been having this spring, interrupted by two very good ones given by Lizzie. Uh, if I remember correctly, Tom, you, in fact, trained as a biochemist. Uh, yes, that's right. I'm not sure if that was correct. You then got attracted to archaeological digs. Uh, you did quite a lot of those in the north of England. You did your PhD on the either ancient or at any rate old woodlands in North Yorkshire. Something that must have come in very useful for T. Swale uh, project that turned away at present. Uh, at one time you worked for Natural England. I remember you saying you that they were on probation, not you. And then you moved, if I've got the name right, what is now called English heritage. Uh, and I believe that's where you're still working. Uh, I think you, you work there part time. What you do with the rest of the time, I think must be um, work extremely hard on acquiring money for the um, Teasdale Special Flora Trust. Uh, I'm rather pleased I'm not involved in the minutiae of all of that. I think you must have put in very many hours and all of us need to be grateful to you. Well, it now falls to your lot, Tom, to talk about the Teasdale Special Flora Trust. Uh, to give it its full title, and well, something seems to be blocking some of it out on my screen, but, uh, oh no, <laughs> that's better. It is, the full title is Tuesday Special Flora Research and Conservation Trust. And we must forget the research bit of it. Right, Tom, I'm looking forward, and I'm sure everybody else, to what you've got to tell us. I'm going, I'm going to start by, by being very naughty, Margaret, and correcting you. It's actually called the Dr. Margaret Bradshaw Teasdale Special for a Research and Conservation Trust. Um, uh, but, 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 but yes. And for very good reasons, um, which we will go into later. Um, so I, I wanted to sort of cover three main topics in my in, in my talk today. So I'd like to say something about the flora. I know that the, the flora of Teasdale has been covered by others, particularly Margaret, probably much better extensively than, than I will do. And I, I, will, I will do that fairly quickly, but I want to sort of say a few things about why it's important and, and what the history of the flora is, how it came to be here, and perhaps what part of Teasdale special in that sense. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the conservation of the flora, um, I've called it conservation in Teasdale. I'm not going to talk about plant, uh, about animals or birds or anything or insects or anything like that. I'm concentrating purely on plants. Um, uh, and then I, I'll talk a little bit about the Teasdale Special Flora it's Trust itself, its history, what we do, uh, why it exists, and, and how I think it fits in with the general conservation landscape, if you like. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I shall move on. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you can see the slide changes. I'm always a bit dubious about technology. So, so great, Trish says that slide changes uh, happened. So 
what is the tea star flora and how did it develop? Um, I start with a few facts. These these are contained in a report by John O'Reilly, uh, which he was produced for the trust um, in 2019, um, and just a few. There's there's over 100 plants. I think we're looking at 137 plants. A list of 137 plants, which we consider special to the history of the landscape of Teesdale and special to this area. Um, of those plants, two species only occur in Teesdale within the United Kingdom. Um, so the spring junction is one of those. The other one is the one that's pictured, which is um, the, the Teesdale sandwort. Um, two more, oops, it's not changing. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go back. It's changed too fast now. Right, so the second one, it's this, so there's two more that only have their, their only English sites are in Teesdale. So one, the one pictured is Tophelia, the, the Scottish asphodel, uh, which here is at its southernmost distribution in the UK. Um, five plants are at the southern edge of their distribution in the United Kingdom. So here I've picked on the Nana, um, as an example of one of those. Uh, and four are at their northern distribution uh, in Teesdale, the northernmost limit of their distribution. So that makes Teesdale a rather peculiar place because it's got groups of plants which are at their, their northernmost point and it's got groups of plants that overlap with that. Uh, which are at their southernmost, the southernmost distribution. 18 of our list of 137 plants are nationally rare. 35 are nationally scarce. 28 of them are on the UK red list, which means that they're considered to be threatened with extinction. So that sort of group of facts together, uh, it, it makes Teesdale one of the top five botanical areas in the United Kingdom, um, and and um, and and a place that should be really high on everybody's list of of important conservation areas. I'll say a little bit now about the the history of those plants, why they're here. Um, so part of that flora is, is uh, a, a plants which love light and space, uh, plants which spread into Teesdale at a time shortly after the last ice age, when most of the landscape was covered in what was effectively ground glut rock uh, left by the glace, last glaciation around about 10 to 12,000 years ago. And at that time, um, because sea level was much lower, um, those plants could spread directly to this country across the North Sea um, from where they were growing on the continent. Um, I'm just going to uh, show you a little bit of, this is um, so, uh, uh, something called a LIDAR image. So the, the Environment Agency takes these, um, it's, it's effectively a laser scan of the ground surface um, taken from an aeroplane and the Environment Agency does this to assess flood risk and drainage um, systems, um, but it's, it, they make it available to the general public, um, so you can find it on the internet. And it's a really good way of viewing the landscape. And what you can see here is a bit of Teesdale around Langdon Beck. Um, I think Langdon Beck is a roughly there, if you can see my cursor. Um, can, can you see that? Okay, and what you can see is that that, that landscape has a grain. It's, 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 it's like a series of long mounds, which are drumlins left by the last glaciation. And if, if you kind of look at that, you can kind of envisage all that fresh ground rock left by the last glaciation, sort of running down Teesdale, sort of almost sort of spread across the surface of the dale at that time. And imagine all that open, open habitat that must have existed in that early post-glacial period. 
um, as woodland developed, again, coming across the land bridge from um, uh, across the North Sea from the continent, those um, the open areas were maintained by large animals and also to some extent um, encouraged by by man. So so man, um, the hunter gatherers that would have lived in the developing woodland, um, uh, 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 say sort of from about 8000 um, BC would have, um, there's good evidence that they, they maintained clearances by burning, for instance, as in order to attract large grazing animals and also um, attract sort of um, fruiting of things like hazelnuts, which, which would have been a major food source. So that would have then maintained some open habitats and prevented these light loving plants being entirely shaded out. But that these plant populations would have become localized, partly because of development of woodland uh, and, and therefore shading, but also a soil peat formation. Um, and some uh, populations may later, once, um, once uh, humans introduced agriculture, may have been destroyed by early agriculture because some of the more productive soils would also have had some of these plants on them um, and, and would have been ploughed up um, in early agriculture. But the surviving populations maintained by, have been maintained to the present day by grazing. So if, if it weren't for grazing, these plants would have been entirely shaded out because they would have, because they're light loving plants. Um, uh, and and it's, it's partly human activity, of course, that has maintained the populations of grazing animals. The, the second, second sort of important part of the, the Teasdale flora is the meadow flora. And, and these are mainly shade tolerant plants, which again, probably arrived reasonably soon after the uh, um, last glaciation, but a little bit later alongside trees and shrubs. And they would have been typical of the open grazed woodland, which was common in Teasdale and much of the rest of the country for the first 8,000 or so years after the last ice age, until um, open landscapes um, produced by gra grazing animals um, managed by man and, and, and cultivation um, formed the majority of the landscape. And that's the turning point between um, wooded landscapes and agricultural landscapes happens during the Bronze Age, about 1,000 BC, 2,000 years ago. Um, and it isn't until the Iron Age, about 5,000 BC, that the vast majority of the landscape is, is, it becomes open and is unwooded. So would, it's only in, in, in about 500 BC that, that, that woodland becomes a small part of the, land, of the British landscape. But the sequence of events which leads to the, the meadow flora becoming associated with species rich hay meadows is probably quite a complex one. And I'm going to, the next couple of slides are going to illustrate why I say that. So I'm going back to another a LIDAR image, this time of Holwick and what, or part of Holwick. And what you can see there is, although this is one of the sort of hot spots for species rich hay meadows, that landscape is covered in what look like stripes. And those stripes are actually something called strip lynchets. They're evidence of um, medieval ploughing in strips. So what that's telling us is that that landscape has been, has been cultivated. And in fact, you can see other things on this. So again, so these are the strips, if you strip lynchets here. So they're the result of cultivation. Here, there's a little enclosure. That enclosure is probably a prehistoric enclosure from the late Iron Age. Um, up, up, up here, underlying those strip lynchets, is prehistoric field boundary. Um, 
So what we're looking at is a landscape which has a very long history of cultivation, but in spite of that, it has a very rich hay meadow flora. So those, those that hay meadow flora can't have got into these hay meadows directly from woodland. It has to have come in another way. Um, I, I'll, give, I'll illustrate that in another way. We're looking at, that. this is a photograph of that same area. And what you can see here, this, this long low mound is a drumlin left by the, la the, the, the glaciation. And across it, you can see this series of strips, which are the, the, the evidence of medieval cultivation. Here is that prehistoric settlement, which has been avoided by the medieval cultivation, probably because it's too stony. And sitting on it, you can see a little field buyer, buyer which had a, a, um, a little enclosure around it, which, which, which was used for sucking uh, garth. Um, so it, it, it almost encapsulates this photograph, the, the history of that piece of landscape. So if there's, there's a couple of ways in which those hay meadow plants could get into the modern species rich hay meadows. One, the most obvious one is that when these meadows ceased to be cultivated and became, were seeded as, as meadows, seeded with grass, people used the sweepings from hay barns or the seed that dropped out of, of haystacks in order to seed them, because that would have been the only sort of, sort of seed they had. So the original, the meadows that, that that hay came from would have been species rich and would have contained all those, those nice woodland plants. And that would have meant that the reseeded meadows also had those plants. The other place that, that those, those plants could have come from is from hedgerows, field boundaries within this landscape. Um, so some of those hedges may well have been carved out of the original wildwood, if you like, when this, when this landscape was originally enclosed during the prehistoric. And some of those, those hedges would have preserved some of the woodland plants that were in the woodlands that that, 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 that field system was carved out of. Uh, and, and so some of the plants may have spread into the hay meadows from those hedges. So it's, 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 it's a complicated sequence in which man has, plays a, a, a very major role. And then there's the special case of the Alcamillas, the ladies' mantles. Now, Margaret, as some of you may know, had a very important role to play in researching ladies' mantles in Teesdale uh, and um, discovered populations of ladies' mantles, which until certainly to, say, in the case of subcranata, which, um, which is here, was, was thought for a long time to be only present in Teesdale in the UK. I think it's now known in Lancashire as well. But, um, but it's, it's very odd that there should be um, ladies' mantles which, with such localised distributions. And one thought about that is that this was a medicinal plant um, and that it was actually intentionally introduced. It was brought in by man. The most obvious um, candidates, culprits, being the Vikings who settled um, Teesdale in the 10th century um, and, and left a good deal of evidence in terms of place names for their present presence, as well as various archeological features. So it's possible that the man actually brought some of these plants in themselves and they became naturalized. Um, very difficult to be certain of that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how you would prove it. So moving on to plants conservation. I think about this, I, I, originally I was thinking of it in three different phases, but they aren't really phases because they overlap but it's, it's three different strands. And the first strand, um, so the first published um, record of, of 
plants in, in Teesdale, special plants in Teesdale, is, is a record of the shrubby shank foil in 1677. Um, incidentally, I recommend that if you're interested in the history of plant discovery in Teesdale, um, you there's a there's a really good article on the available on the internet by Margaret and Judith Turner, from which I, I have to admit I drew most of this information. Um, so, so um, yes, so so do if you want to know more about this subject, please do refer look that up on on, on the internet. So. John Ray was probably shown the shrubby sink foil and a number of other plants in Teesdale by the vicar of Brignall, um, uh, uh, Ralph Johnson. Um, and the sort of records of, um, of, of rare plants in Teesdale increase, the, the published records increase during the 18th and 19th century. And by the 19th century, plant collecting was was starting was became a major threat to some of the plants in Teesdale. So uh, one example of that is Rosia, which was made entirely um, extinct by fern collectors during the 19th century and has recently been reintroduced. Um, another example is bitter milkwort. Um, um, uh, Polygaela armorello, which whose populations were seriously depleted as a result of plant collecting, um, but the period of discovery actually carries on. So one might um, one might mention again Margaret's work in the nineteen fifties on her alcamillas, where she um, where she discovered several new species in Teesdale, and even more recently as a result of the work paid for by the um, Teesdale Special Flora Trust, Trust um, John O'Reilly discovered a new eyebright to Teesdale in 2019, Ostenfeld's eyebright. So there, there are still discoveries to be made and disco still discoveries be being made um, in Teesdale. So that, that, that phase of, of conservation isn't over. The second sort of strand of conservation um, is activism. So for me, this really starts with the uh, planning of, of Cow Green Reservoir in, in the late 1960s and the opposition to Cow Green Reservoir. And again, as you know, um, Margaret played a significant role in that opposition. Um, and that, that opposition really put, it highlighted the importance of the Teesdale flora at the time, even though the building of Cow Green Reservoir resulted in the destruction of, of about 10% of the, the, the area of the habitat for, for some of the rare plants. Um, I think one of the things I would say is that while for most people, that period of activism around um, cow, cow green, the building of Cow Green Reservoir, most people went away and, 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 and did other things. In Margaret's case, she continued to be active um, uh, for the conservation of, of the Teesdale flora and still, still active for that, which is, which is why I put her picture up here. And that, that activity, that activism, has culminated in, in 2017 in, in the creation of Dr. Margaret Bradshaw's Teesdale Special Flora Research and Conservation Trust. I've shortened that to Teesdale Special Flora here, but that, that is the proper, proper name of the trust that she set up in 2017. In terms of the conservation of the flora, I, again, I want to separate it into the two strands. I've called the open habitat flora, if you like, the light loving plants, Arctic alpines. Margaret, I apologize for this because I know they aren't all Arctic alpines. And as we, I mentioned before, some of them are species which have a southern distribution and are at their northernmost limit. 
but it, 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 it was shorthand from my, from my point of view. And I think one of the key things for the conservation of those, that far part of the flora was the creation of the Moorhouse National Nature Reserve in 1969. Again, to some extent triggered by, um, by the building of Cow Green Reservoir. And Tom, uh, Tom, yeah. the Moorhouse, which is two words, National Nature Reserve, was one of the two that were jointly announced as the first ones in England yeah. in 1952. Oh, I've got, I got my facts wrong in that case. I apologise for that. Thank and you. Tom, seeing I have interrupted you. Yes. It is the fact that Teasdale has not only got so-called Arctic Alpines, but has got southern species. Yes. And there's nowhere else in, um, in Britain that has got a similar combination of southern and northern species. Yes, no, I understand that, Margaret. Yeah, but Natural England have for years just talked about the Arctic Alpines. Yes, no, I understand. And I'm afraid it rubs me up every time that they miss the point that yeah. it's the combination with the southern species yeah. that makes the area so important. And it is the very shallow soils that developed on the sugar limestone and also cliffs and riverside that allowed open habitats to be continued right from the uh, early post-glacial times up to present times. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, thank you. That's that's fine. I think most of the most of the action which has taken place for the conservation of those open habitat plants. Um, has taken under the auspices, has taken place under the auspices of the National Nature Reserve. So that includes things like rabbit control, soil stabilization, adjustments to the grazing, and, and more recently mowing to, to allow more light, light in and encourage grazing animals. I would say that a good deal of that, again, has been that management has been encouraged by Margaret's activism and also Margaret's monitoring efforts. So, for instance, the rabbit control has the, the success of that has been monitored by Margaret monitoring the number of rabbit pellets on some of her plots. Um, so, I, I want to sort of emphasize how much. That, that that sort of outside look and that activism, that outside observation of the, the, the NNR management and the advice that's been given on NNR management, how important that's been to have somebody outside looking in um, to, what, to at what Natural England is doing. With hay meadow restoration, it's slightly different. So um, the first agri-environment schemes, the ESA scheme, um, was created in, in 1987, and I hope I have got, have got that date right, <laughs> Margaret. Um, uh, and, and there have been subsequent agri-environment schemes, and though one might question some of the, the management, certainly they've learned as those schemes have, go along, have gone along what the right management for hay meadows might be, and are still learning, I hope, that the, the, the the hay, the hay meadow management has been a fo focus of all agri-environment schemes since the, the environmentally sensitive uh, area scheme in, 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 the, in the late 70s. And there's been a number of North Pennines A O N B projects on um, hay meadows too. So the first one of those was the hay time project in 2006, and that has been followed by 
plugging the gap, which was about using um, growing on plug plants and introducing those into um, hay meadows for restoration. There was nectar works, which con concentrated on the unmown banks within hay meadows. And there's the new um, AONB project, Tees Swale, which is looking at both Teesdale and Swaledale and a number of other things as well as hay meadow conservation. But those, those um, efforts have, have been quite considerable and have drawn on um, projects elsewhere in the country because of course the hay meadow flora has things in common with species rich hay meadows elsewhere. So there's a lot of experience to draw on. And I think that's one aspect of the hay meadows which is different from the more open, the more specialized sugar limestone lab habitats, the, the habitats on sugar limestones and cliffs uh, and the other habitats that Margaret's just mentioned in the sense that those other habitats are unique to, swell, to Teesdale um, and don't, don't actually occur anywhere else. So if you're going to do research on them, you need to do it here. So, Moving on, um, I'll talk a little bit about Teesdale Special Flora itself, organisation and our history. So as I've said before, it was created, the Teesdale, sorry, the Margaret Bradshaw Teesdale Special Flora Research and Conservation Trust was started by Ma Margaret in 2007 with a very generous bequest. Um, Am I allowed to say how much it was, Margaret? <laughs> Is that a shake of the head? Uh, you're muted. That's fine. Um, but that, there was a, a very generous request by Margaret, who was concerned to make sure that the, the special flora continued to be cared for. Um, and the, the apparent declines in the flora were, were recorded and preferably reversed, acted upon and reversed. That um, the, 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 the trust then became a registered company and a ch registered charity in 2000. Um, and there were two reasons for that. One was, that we wanted to be able to raise more money, both by, um, by fundraising from the general public, but also because becoming a, a registered charity made it much easier to apply for grants. Um, and, and that has been very important in what we've done since. We then joined forces with the Upper Teesdale Botany Group in 2021. And again, the reasons for that from the trust point of view were that it greatly increased our ability to engage with the general public. From the botany group point of view, uh, what that does is it means that they can access um, the insurance that is available to the, to the charity, to Teesdale Special Flora, for volunteer activities and uh, bring that much more into a, 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 a sort of a, a responsible and efficient way of running the group. Um, so it has it has benefits for both parties, uh, and I think it's it's the start of a very positive relationship. Of course, both were started by um, by Margaret anyway. Um, the, the T Upper Teesdale Botany Group has been going on for a lot longer than the Trust. So what are we for? Um, I'm just going to move. Right. So we, we're here to promote for public benefit, protection, conservation, improvement of the physical and natural environment and biodiversity and to advance the education of the public in conservation, protection, and improvement of the physical and natural environment. So those are our public purposes. In practice, that includes conducting botanical surveys, 
sharing the findings with land managers and agencies, supporting the Upper Teesdale Botany Group, and encouraging interest through guided walks, lectures, exhibitions, and I would add publications to that. Um, so for instance, under our current project, project we're, we're publishing um, two flora guides. One is a republishing of the Tees Bank flora that the Botany Group did a few years ago, and another is um, Woody Bank, flora of Woody Bank and Cronkley Fells. Um, um, and this is this this slide covers the area that we shows the area that we cover. So essentially, um, it runs from the River Boulder in the south right along the um, watershed um, of the Tees, um, including sort of, sort of running across sort of some of the more interesting um, high um, uh, areas of, of Cross Fell, um, Great Dunfell and Little Fell, and then running along the, the, the watershed between the Tees and the Weir before coming down the Eggles Burn um, and back to, back to Eggleston and the Tees. Um, so it's, 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 it's a large area of, of, of Upper Teesdale. The circumference of that is around 55 miles and includes um, the, the, it includes the majority of the sort of, in, of the really interesting habitats in Upper Teesdale. Moving on to who we are. Um, so we were founded, as I've said, by Margaret who is also our director. Um, the rest of us trustees consist of myself as the chair, Bruce Wilkinson, who grew up in Lonton, um, but, it, but now works for um, Natural England, uh, who's our vice chair, Jeff Herbert, who's treasurer, Julia Nelson, who, um, who lives in Middleton, is our secretary. Lizzie um, Madison, uh, Linda, sorry, Linda Robinson, Martin Rogers, Richard Friend, and, um, and Trish, sorry, I'm having trouble with my screen. And Trish is the Botany Group representative who comes to, um, to, to trust meetings. So that, that essentially is us. Um, in terms of where we fit in, um, you've had in this series of talks, you've heard from a wide group of people all, all involved in the delivery of, of in, in the conservation of Teesdale's flora. You've heard from landowners and land managers who deliver the practical management. You've heard from Natural England, who incentivize through agro-environment schemes and regulate through SSSI regulations and other forms of regulation. They also deliver management on the National Nature Reserve. You've heard from the North Pennines ONB, who deliver a considerable amount of investment through their projects that they have funded mainly by the National Lottery. And you, then there's Teesdale Special Flora. And so the way, place I think we fit in is in terms of re research, in terms of ad advocacy, effectively continuing that tradition of activism and by engaging the public and creating greater public awareness of how important this flora is. And that, that public engagement then helps maintain the investment that those other bodies can put into it. So how are we funded? Um, as I said, Margaret's, we were, we were initially founded with Margaret's bequest. Since then, we've done quite a bit of fundraising with the general public. Um, many of you, again, will remember Teasdale, uh, uh, Margaret's trek for Teasdale last summer, 
which uh, which raised um, I think now it's about nine thousand pounds for the trust last year. We've had grants from other charities. So the Wildflower Society has given us five thousand pounds over five years, which has been extremely useful in attracting other funding too. We've received grants. So we um, this last summer uh, uh, part of our survey work was funded uh, via the AONB and the farm in the, under the Farming in Protected Landscape Scheme. Um, and of course, we're currently in the process of um, delivering a major project called Plan the Edge, uh, which is funded uh, under the government's, uh, now I'll get this right, Green Recovery, Green Recovery Challenge Scheme. Um, and we've also had money directly from Natural England for some of our survey work. So, looking at our projects. So, um, the, our longest running project is this a special flora survey. The um, Cronkley Arctic Alpine research project was the sub-project funded last summer by, um, by Farming and Protected Landscapes and Plants on the Edge is a project which is funded under the Green Recovery Challenge Fund. The Upper Teesdale Botany Group has its own projects, um, the main ones being its talks and field programs and the single species plot recording which is done by the, the, the uh, Teesdale Champions. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble moving on. So in terms of the BET special flora based and survey, um, John O'Reilly, the surveyor, we, we, we have employed since 2017 to undertake that, um, produced a, a report in, in 2019. His survey essentially covers, or it will eventually hopefully cover all the the most significant habitats for special flora in Teesdale. Um, he's con up till now he's concentrated on the bank fell um, and has surveyed over 8,000, uh, has a, yes, has, has say, surveyed over 80 hectares of habitat, um, measuring the presence or absence of plants in 10 meter square. So he's measuring the presence or absence of 137, list of 137 plants in each 10 meter square. That is incredibly important work because without it, we wouldn't know whether the Teasdale flora is doing well or doing badly. Unfortunately, the conclusions he's reached is that it's doing really quite badly with an average of 50% decreases in most flora. The Cronkley Arctic Alpines research is essentially a continuation of that work that happened over last summer um, in, on Cronkley Fell. So the red areas, the, the, the yellow areas are the areas of interest on Cronkley Fell and the, um, the red areas are the, the areas that were done last year. Um, so clearly there's more work to be done there, and a lot of that will be done under our current project, Plants on the Edge. Plants on the Edge is a much bigger project, which is funded by the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, but we have two partners in that. One is the North Pennines AONB, and the other is Northern Heartlands, who have helped us hugely with um, delivering the outreach part of this project and also employ Naomi Priestley, our outreach officer. Um, so there are two, strat two main strands to this. One is uh, nature recovery and the other, the other strand is our engagement and enabling strand. So the nature recovery Strand includes a, a continuation of John O'Reilly's baseline survey. 
it also includes a monitoring plan. This is um, a document, a study which looks at everything, all the research that's been done in the flora so far, and lays out what we need to do in order to monitor that flora in the future and the success of any management interventions. And that's really important because it helps us gain a know what we need to do in the future to, to, to do that monitoring, but it also helps us having it all written down, helps us gain the funding that we'll need in order to do that, the resources in order to do that. And then finally, there's a species recovery plan. This is looking at management interventions. So are there some practical management interventions that have already been carried out and are being evaluated as a proper scientific study as part of this? There are others where we're just doing a desktop study to find out what we think the potential is. And that includes plant propagation um, uh, and, uh, and the collecting of seed, which might seem an obvious thing to do, but it's, it, we need to be very careful about actions like that because some of these plants don't produce very much seed. And just because you put seed somewhere doesn't mean it's going to grow. So the, the one needs to be very careful about that kind of intervention. Another strand of, the, of plants on the edge is an enabling strand. And this is really about making the trust and the botany group more capable of doing the work they need to do. There's, a strand, there's it's partly trust strategy and planning, a volunteer program, um, and ensuring that the, the, the volunteers and the, uh, and the people who got, run the botany group and, and also the, the T-Cell Special Flora Trust have the skills they need in order to, to, to undertake their work. There's been some branding and communications work. And what you can see on the screen uh, is part of the result of that work. So the Teasdale Special Flora and the Upper Teasdale Botany Group now have logos, which might seem unimportant, but if we want to have an identity that we can promote in the wider world in order to raise money, in order to do our work, then we have to have a defined and recognizable identity. And there's also, a good deal that we need to learn about using digital and social media in order to gain attention and gain money and get uh, and reach people that can help us main, uh, preserve the flora. And then there's the engagement side of plants on the edge. So amongst the things that will be done through that, are, 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 the creation of an exhibition. There are plant ID guides which are already um, have already gone to print um, and should be available uh, soon um, later this year. There's a cute schools and community outreach project. There'll be walks and talks during the summer, and of course there are the botany group activities of which this is a part. The botany group itself has its own activities. Um, so as I've mentioned, that includes this current talk program, it includes the summer field season, and it includes more detailed single species survey work, which is done by a particular sort of smaller group of the botany group called the champions. So that's where we are now. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about our plans for the future. We need to carry on with the baseline survey. I think John O'Reilly estimated that it'll take another 30 years to complete the survey of the most important parts of the, of, of the teased populations of Teasdale flora. That's a very significant job. Just being part of that is important, but we need to do a lot more than we currently have. And that needs to continue and we need to find 
the, the resources in order to carry on doing that. We'd like to do a comparative survey. So we know on Weedy Bank Fell the, that we, we think we know that the, what the declines have been. We can measure the declines by comparing John's survey with the surveys that Margaret did with volunteers shortly after the creation of the, the Cow Green Reservoir. Margaret, you're shaking your head. Do you, do you want, you'll have to unmute. I think I'd better stay muted. Okay, so, um, the, so that comparison is a really key comparison for, for, for measuring the declines of the Teasdale flora over that period. Um, what we'd like to do is pay somebody, so a, a, a woman called Lisa Buchens did a survey last summer of a, a selection of plants comparing the survey method that was used in the 1970s with the survey methods that's being used by John to see how comparable those two survey methods were and, in that, and, and on that basis, how robust John's conclusions are about the declines. That's a really important piece of work if we want to have, reach robust conclusions and give robust advice on the state of the flora. We'd like to fund Lisa to do some more of that work. And we'd like that to happen in the coming year to make sure that that's statistically robust. And we, we, know, we know that our conclusions are correct. Obviously, we'd like to continue with the botany group activity in the longer term. And I don't see any reason why that shouldn't happen. We'd like to include, to continue our wider engagement. Naomi Priestley has already massively increased the amount we engage with schools and the wider public. And over this summer, we hope that a great deal more will happen. Um, but we'd like to, to make sure that we continue that work. Um, and I think Margaret is very keen that the local Teasdale population is more involved and more aware of the Teasdale special flora. We'd also like to continue supporting conservation. And by that, I'm referring to the work that is started under our species recovery plan, but um, we hope will continue into the future. So we need to investigate and, and encourage more conservation work and find out what works, what doesn't work. And um, again, there's something that potentially we could do in the next coming years because we've been approached by Kew Gardens and the Millennium Seed Bank to collect seed from Teasdale, from rare Teasdale plants, we need to consider whether that's a project that we would like to be involved in um, and, and has potential for, for, for conserving the flora. But that's something that, as I've said, there are questions that need to be asked and some of those will be answered by our current species recovery plan. But there's a, there's a great deal to do, and there'll continue to be a great deal to do well into the future. I think I'm going to stop there and take questions, but I would also say that there are other members of the trust, including Margaret here, which may be able to answer the, some of the questions better than me. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so if anybody would like to ask any questions, um, Margaret, did you have a question to start with? Well, I don't have a question. I just want to give a little clarification in respect of Archibald or Lady's mantle species. There are six in Teesdale that are native species and extend certainly further north into Scotland. But there were three meadow species which have been found predominantly in Teesdale and Weardale, 
with a few outliers in Northumberland and probably Lancashire. And it's those three species, those three species uh, which uh, I did the distribution of them in Cheesedale and Weirdale, which are um, fairly frequent in the meadows and open woodland in the Alps, for example. And it's just that group of three that are very special to Teesdale. That's it. Well, thank you, Margaret. Um, Richard, did you... Oh, I seem to stop my video. Oh, I, I, Richard, uh, you're unmuted. Were you wanting a question, Richard Friend? Oh no, not really. Um, I can <laughs> make an observation. I can make an observation or two. I, I, I think that the trust is is very interesting. It's certainly, I think, it's sort of where the zeitgeist is in terms of of funding um, and sort of community conservation. If you look, if there's a really interesting podcast by a guy called Matt Candias or something like that, um, called In Defense of Plants, he's American, um, but he's interviewed pretty much every botanist in the, in the United States and every sort of person of interest in the botanical world. And it's very surprising how many community organizations are running really major projects in the States. I mean, and that's probably where we're going over here as we uh, move away from social democracy and become more interested in the personal individualism etc um that's where our politics seem to be going so that's probably where our funding is going so um you know that's that's perhaps where we're, be, we're going to be going in the future in terms of conservation um so if as a community organization that's you know we're right on the edge of where that needs to be i think um obviously things have changed in the last last few years there's lots more interest um, but, you know, places, so a similar place is Ben Laws in Scotland. They've got 75 very active, very qualified, you know, well, you know, uh, amateur botanists working on on uh, conservation products, projects up there. So, you know, that's not a that's not a heavily populated area either. You know, so 75 people out doing botanical stuff quite regularly up there. Um, it's just a matter of keeping hold of them. You, Richard. Um, Lizzie, you're unmuted. Were you wanting a question or are you just unmuted? I was just unmuted, but I would. I was just wondering, Tom, um, in terms of the hay meadows and their value in carbon fixation, you know, I've been reading quite a lot about how the ancient grasslands are be becoming um, really quite significant. It's been realised that they're quite significant in carbon fixation. And I was wondering, you know, has there been any research on the hay meadows in that respect that you're aware of? I'm, I'm not, not aware of any research specifically in Teesdale. No, um, I, 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 I think there is increasingly research into the relationship between grassland management and, and carbon sequestration. So I'm aware of uh, a farm in Northumberland, for instance, where an organic farm where that's taking place in um, in respect to their grazing machine regime and there's, they're involved with Newcastle University doing that. Um, I don't know if anything's being done under Tees Swale. It'd be interesting to find out because it's probably something that you would have thought that Tees Swale might be interested in. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Whilst we're we're thinking of questions, um, sorry. Uh, whilst we're thinking of questions, I, I think we all ought to have a very big thank you for Tom, because Tom is presented this um, evening from his mother's ninetieth birthday get together. Oh. So he seriously put himself out to give this presentation tonight, and I, I think it's a really big thank you and a testament to the commitment that people have to this to the whole group and what we're actually doing that that he's prepared to do this from 
somewhere not where he's comfortable from presenting from. So a, a very big thank you, Tom, for doing this tonight. Um,